Okay, here's the um, title of the talk. We will remember them. This talk is a hybrid of a talk I was planning to give way back when we planned this back in the spring, and, um, and the talk that needs to be given in light of recent circumstances in the United States, especially in Charlottesville and all over the South. Um, my original talk was history of national memorials in the United States with some European background, so you'll get plenty of that, plus some new material about Confederate statues, memorials, etc. But the emphasis is going to be on the history, and some of the history pretty old, um, because there's plenty of coverage in the news media today about Confederate memorials, so I'm going to try to contextualize as that for an academic word. I'm going to place the, our current controversy subspecie eternitatis under the species of eternity and history, and maybe that will help matters a little bit. I hope so. So there's our title, and what might be a better title, because this is the way life is on Earth, and I think always has been. I think if you go to a place on Earth that is yet to hear of modern life, you will probably still find a conflict going on there between the people who want to change things and the people that want to keep things more or less the way they are. So human communities are bound together by many things, but one of the most important is memories, memories of any number of things. We can be united by a traumatic memory. We can be un divided by a traumatic memory memory, and of important memories, the, perhaps the most important are memories of sacrifice or turning points in history, or an important person or persons who made the sacrifice and made history, and of course these things all tend to happen together. A great person, a great sacrifice, a great turning point, a great battle, either on the battlefield or in parliament, and so we remember this big turning point in history. And I will mostly show photographs and let the photographs speak for themselves. But just to get a couple of things as background. Now, most of the monuments and memorial statues I'm going to show you are not great ones, but this is what we're looking for. I'll save the great one until the end. But the idea of any memorial, and we could be talking about a memorial in a public park, or just something you want to remind yourself of, is if you've had a trauma, you want to remember the trauma, but you don't want to make it worse by constantly thinking about it. So if you learn a life lesson, you want to learn the lesson and move on. You don't want to focus on it forever and ever and ever. So then a good memorial or a good life lesson learned connects you to others, reminds you of your higher purpose so you can reset yourself, and then at a very important place on earth, something deep and essential to human life upon the earth is being celebrated there. If we go to a special place and do something special, it could reset our whole lives improve our attitude, make us feel better. So, broken us into four periods. The age of democratic memorials beginning with World War I. So the British, our British cousins are very good at doing somber stuff. So here you are in November in the United Kingdom in London. You can almost see the fog swirling around these figures. And this big object here, there we go, that's the cenotaph. So what they did is they brought a memorial, a symbolic cemetery and battlefield into the heart of London, and this is relatively new. There have been memorials for fallen soldiers forever, but usually at the battlefield itself. Um, nation's capitals, seldom had 
a democratic memorial to all the soldiers that fell. They left that for the battlefield and they put up a statue of the general somewhat later. But there's the cenotaph and there's our words. These words are still spoken all over the British Commonwealth on Remembrance Day, which we call Veterans Day. So Remembrance Day is the Sunday closest to November 11th throughout the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. They repeat this stanza of a poem by Lawrence Binion. And there it is today in full color. The royal family comes, they lay wreaths, their parades, flags. You might remember after the latest royal wedding, the happy couple came here right after the right after the wedding to pay their respects. And it's very simple, it's very decorous. That's the inscription there. And that's how that's the only inscription on it. Nothing about the purpose of the war. Because by the time this war came to an end, no one could remember what the heck the purpose was in the first place. I mean, that's how, how bloody awful this particular war was. Why are we, at the end, why, why did we fight? Uh, no, no one could remember. So that's all you had to say. Now there's another memorial designed by the same fellow, Sir Edwin, Sir Edwin Lutyens, also designed the Houses of Parliament in, um, or the Governor's Palace in Delhi, in New Delhi. This is Deepfall. That's in Flanders. Um, British soldiers have been dying in Flanders for 600 years at this point. Every time you turn around in British history, they've landed an expeditionary force in Flanders. So there they are. And this is a huge piece. See the people down there? Oops, excuse me. So it's large and names, all the names of those who fell in all the battles of the Somme are remembered. There, there they are, the list of names. So you see, we're in the age of democratic memorials. So many men died that they had to try to remember all of them. Now, these memorials are popular throughout Northern Europe, um, North France, Belgium, on that borderland. That's uh, President Hollande, and that's uh, Chancellor Merkel. Note the flags crosses behind. They do this every year. The President of France, the Chancellor of Germany, get together at one of these, at one of dozens, dozens of uh, burial places and cemeteries in the north of France and Belgium. And some years they even get a little more in, in, intimate. Now, oops, excuse me. See our flags again, the reeds. That's Mitterrand and Helmut Kohl. This is 30, 40 years ago now. And um, just to show you how important the memory of World War I still is in Europe, that's um, President Hollande right after he took the oath of office. After the French president takes the oath of office, he immediately comes here to the Tomb of the Unknown, lays a wreath, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, here under the Arch of Triumph. So they've converted a Napoleonic... Uh, monument to grandiosity, you might say, it's pretty pretty big, and have turned it into a into a cemetery. And that's a portrayal of Greek soldiers parading through the Arch of Triumph in a victory parade at the end of the World War, the Great War, nineteen twenty. Notice we've got a French officer here and a Greek officer there. I'm sure it was a very festive occasion, and that was a cenotaph, one of the, it's an Egyptian event, invention, more on that some other time. Now, this is one of my favorite photographs, not because of what's going on here, this is the German army marching into Paris 20 years later, <clears throat> you might say a solemn, a solemn occasion, but notice what these soldiers are doing and notice especially where they are not walking. They are marching around the Arch of Triumph. 
even the German army at this point, June of 1940, would not walk across the grave of a soldier. Simple as that. So it's always something to think about if you're dealing with memorials. Someone put them up. <coughs> Someone cares about that somebody they put the memorial up to. At any rate, these soldiers would not step on the grave of another soldier. And then time passes. Five years later, German army departs. Churchill and de Gaulle arrive. And of course, you have a parade. So in a way, parades and, um, and memorials and sculptures, intimately connected. A memorial is like a permanent victory parade or a permanent parade for a more solemn occasion. And we've copied this sort of thing. This is at Arlington. How many of you have been to Arlington Cemetery? Anyone? Okay. Great place to do this. Very, very stirring to see this. And there's a soldier here all the time. Blizzard, hurricane, they're, they're still there. And this is President Obama laying a wreath so we don't forget. Now, when did all this start? Well, this is not the first memorial to um, soldiers, but one of the earliest that remains. This is in Thermopylae. You've all seen the movie 300 Spartans. Either the first one or the second one, maybe the third one. They're probably on 300 Spartans 4 by now. And it's a really good, simple memorial with an epitaph on it by Simonides. Very simple, quite decorous. We lost, but retained our dignity. Pretty important. And there it is now. I kind of like that. I mean, what a, what a setting. Okay, moving along here. Memorials to heroic leaders. <coughs> a little more common. So here's a heroic leader. Any guesses as to who this might be? Country, century, anything? Just shout it out. You don't need to. Charlemagne. Charlemagne certainly admired people like this. And he probably had even heard of him. Charlemagne could not read or write, but he, he, um, he had people come in and lecture to him. He had people come in and read to him. He was a very, very bright, very interesting human being. Could not read or write, but surrounded himself by people who could. This is Marcus Aurelius, uh, Roman emperor, second century. And this statue um, survived because our our Christian brothers and sisters way back when thought it was Constantine. They thought this gesture was a blessing. So all the other statues of almost everything uh, in Rome, 4th, 5th, 6th century BC, melted down, repurposed, tossed into the river, um, eventually turned into weapons of war, you know, whatever. So not much survived, but uh, this one did. That's another likeness of Marcus Aurelius. He was the last pagan emperor. Um, certainly the last pagan emperor that anyone ever wanted to write about. He was a philosopher. He was a stoical philosopher. He wrote very interesting, very interesting gentleman. And the statue was recovered in the midst of the Renaissance and repurposed and repositioned. So this is Michelangelo's doing. He designed the plinth that it's on in these buildings. So this is Capitol Hill in Rome. And that's the inscription. Let's see, do I give you a translation? There you go. So back in the day, if you were the emperor, you got a, you got a lot of title. It must have been fun being an emperor. All right, now the fact that this guy... Um, probably committed um, war crimes. He probably put a number of cities to the sack. Um, persecution of Christians took place under his rule, which he may or may not have known about. Does anyone care at this point? 
Uh, probably not. He's probably safe. I don't think anyone wants to take him down at this point, especially since it's such a beautiful spot. See, there the statue is. You climb these stairs, and you're surrounded by all this just beautiful statuary. And there you are in the sunshine. It's, uh, I haven't been here. I'd love to go. There's the design. Oh, it's Michelangelo. It's pretty good stuff. So you want to keep this stuff around and views and at night, it's particularly beautiful. So I don't think he's going anywhere. Now, almost a thousand years passed. And there's no relic we could find of any likeness of a man on a horse between 3rd century and the 13th century. This guy's called the Bamberg Reiter. Der Bamberger Reiter. He's in Bamberg Cathedral. And no one knows who he is. There's speculation it must be King somebody or Emperor, one of the Holy Roman Emperors, but there's no inscription on it, and we don't know who it is. So now, look at the body language of this guy and this guy. Look, look. There's an Emperor. See that nicely muscled arm? Sits a horse pretty well. Nice toga. Would you take orders from this slouch? I mean, really, look at this sunken chested, I mean, come on, you know, he couldn't, I mean, not only couldn't he get on a football team, he couldn't get on a soccer team, but <laughs> there he is, so it's a little unusual, all right, all right, so you don't, I mean, sorry, so I'm picking on this poor guy, if you don't know who it is, all right, away we go, there he is again, now, look at this guy. Any better? Has nutrition, nutrition and training improved any? It's about the same time. This is a great seal of Richard I, King Richard I, Richard Coeur That's the best likeness he could find. Now, Richard the Lionhearted, my namesake, I'm pretty proud of this guy. He was fully six foot five, I think, a giant in the Middle Ages. And he could hold up a shield and a sword and hack and slash people which he thoroughly enjoyed doing. He probably personally slayed hundreds of, hundreds of men. I'm not making this up unless the medieval chronicles are just complete nonsense, which of course is possible. But that's the seal of the King of England. Well, and there's an effigy of the King of England. Now that looks at least a little bit better. So this, uh, this lecture, it's part history, it's part politics, part religion, part art history, so in those days, they, um, they could sculpt folds of cloth pretty well, okay? But a, a realistic-looking human body, mm, not so much. Renaissance hasn't happened yet. They couldn't quite pull it off. But now we get to the 19th century. Okay, now this looks, now this looks like a king, right? Every inch a king, well-muscled arm. This is 1860, and that's in, uh, that's in London at Westminster. Much better. And that's a recent depiction of Richard the Richard the Lionhearted. Sure, that's not sharper than notice the lions. Now, <clears throat> this is the next really good looking sculpture of a man on a horse in twelfth century. Ten or twelve centuries, however you do your math. So that's a guy named Erasmo of Narni called Gata Malata. The translations vary on that. It means either the speckled cat or the honeyed cat. Now, how a general, a real, you know, sword-wielding battlefield general got to be called the honeyed cat, I, I, I haven't, haven't figured it out yet. But there he is. And he's a pretty tough-looking guy. <clears throat> and that's the whole setting. And there you go. Well, the art historians are on to something when they say civilization was in a bad way for about a thousand years. Nobody could sculpt anything. Well, unfortunately, nobody can sculpt anything now. But that's a whole, that's a whole new topic. 
All right, now on to heroic and controversial leaders. This is where my lecture really gets fun, I think. So, you all heard of this guy, <laughs> Savonarola? You might call him a proto, a proto Protestant, a proto reformer, a pre Lutheran um, in Renaissance Italy. And uh, he's the guy that invented the bonfire of the vanities. And at his direction, thousands of copies of Dante, Boccaccio, all sorts of literature were piled onto a bonfire and burned, paintings, tapestries, all sorts of beautiful stuff that art historians would really like to pull back out of the void, but it's gone. And um, he torched all this stuff. He was mad about the corruption of uh, Florence, of which there was plenty. Um, and he took over briefly and had his way. But um, there's another likeness of him. There are two statues of him. See, this one, that conveys a good sense of the fanaticism of Savonarola. Now, in this one, they've, the sculptor, this is all 19th century, has tucked him pretty safely into the iconography of, of a Catholic saint. Okay, so he's got a cross. The scowl has been taken away. He looks like a pretty nice saint, but he never was uh, sainted. In fact, he was quite the opposite. He was burnt at the stake. Now, they really knew how to burn people at the stake in those days. They, uh, they got into it, as you see. They made a big festival out of it. And first they hanged you, and then they burned you. Now, why do heretics get burnt? Well, it's so no one's going to collect your bones or figure out where you're buried and wait for your resurrection or something or turn your burial site into a pilgrimage site. So they burn the poor fellow and cast the uh, ashes into the Tiber. So that was the end of Savonarola. Now, anyone recognize this gentleman? Cromwell. Okay. I know some of you out there are Catholics. What do you think of this fellow? You may boo and hiss if you wish. All right, he wasn't that, well, he was bad. He was not a very nice man. There he is depicted as the Lieutenant Commander of Ireland, where he committed some pretty nasty war crimes. He did, he did, he did. But he died. <clears throat> his son tried to rule in his stead. We're talking mid 17th century at this point. Um, his son Richard was a ne'er-do-well and couldn't control things very well. So he um, uh, fled. Charles II returned, and Charles's men exhumed Cromwell's body along with two other people that signed the death warrant for the king, hanged them again as if they needed to, and then and I'm not making this up, displayed their heads on poles for a number of decades, as a matter of fact, just to make sure people got the message that you shouldn't, you shouldn't chop the head off of a king. Um, people played for keeps in those days. It was a tough age, Renaissance until mid-17th century. Nasty time to be alive. Now, okay, so the judgment of history. This is your first long quote, Winston Churchill. I love quoting Winston Churchill. If Churchill doesn't like you, you're pretty bad. So here's Churchill's judgment on Cromwell. Upon all of us there still lies the curse of Cromwell, history of the English-speaking peoples. Nonetheless, there he is. He's... He's got a statue there outside of the Houses of Parliament, Westminster Hall in London. There he is, put up there late 19th century. And yes, there are periodic calls for him to be replaced by something else, almost anything. But there he remains for the moment. Now, another ambivalent character in history. There's Napoleon. Some people still love him. Some people hate him. Uh, he had great propagandists. He had great painters. He was, uh, I mean, he puts any contemporary politician to shame in his propagandistic abilities. But some people didn't like him. So how many of you have seen this painting before? By Goya, a very famous painting. 
So they hear a bunch of Spaniards being executed, a number of inconvenient citizens. So Napoleon, yeah, people love him, people hate him. But there he is, after the unpleasantness, finally he gets a column in the Place Vendôme, so this is central Paris, and there is the Emperor Napoleon up there, looking pretty good, with a winged victory on top of a ball symbolizing rule of the world, victorious over all the world. There's the Emperor with a sword. He, uh, he loved casting his uh, regime into... Um, in the, in the guise of Roman authority. But not everybody liked him. So during the Paris Commune, 1870, right after the Franco-Prussian War, the, f the people of Paris would not sign the peace treaty or abide by it. So they had a revolt within the government, revolted against the French uh, government that signed the peace treaty with the Prussians. And Gustave Courbet, the great painter, um, with, uh, you might say, liberal, progressive, socialist, communard sensibility, said, well, let's get rid of this stupid statue of this nasty emperor. And so, down he came, there he is. Um, but the Paris Commune didn't last very long, and so there is the Emperor Napoleon again in a pretty splendid setting. There you go. Go see, if you're in Paris, go... Go check it out. It looks like a beautiful spot. There he is. I don't think anyone is talking about getting rid of him anytime soon. And now just for comparison purposes, here we are in London. Now who should that be in Trafalgar Square? An admiral. Could it be an admiral who has thwarted the French fleet yet again? Yes, that is. <coughs> That is the great admiral that defeated the French navies. There he is, at the middle of Trafalgar Square on top of a very, very impressive pillar. And remember what I said at the beginning. This is Waterloo. This is a cemetery for the French soldiers, or a memorial. And there's a memorial in Edinburgh for all the Scottish soldiers that died in the in the Napoleonic Wars. And what you notice about this thing is that it looks rather incomplete, and it is, they just ran out of money. And this is what happened a lot in the early 19th century when you were building a war memorial. There wasn't enough nationalist sentiment to pay for the darn things, like this one. This is our own Washington Monument. Had to be publicly funded because Congress was too stingy to pay anything for it. So there it stood, half completed, less than half completed from about 1840-something until the 1880s when it finally got finished. All right, are you tired enough of seeing men on horses? Well, here's a woman on a horse, just for, just for fun. That is Joan of Arc, quite famous. And here she looks just a bit mad. But if you were a 19-year-old girl on top of a horse trying to go and kill a bunch of people, you'd probably look pretty tough as well. Oh, God, I'm sorry. Can you see the expression in the eyes on this? Yeah, it comes out a little bit fuzzy. But anyhow, it's a great statue. And it's not the only one. Well, there she is. She, she got burned at the stake for her pains of creating the French nation. In some ways, she is the father, the mother of the French nation. And there she is, a beautiful, beautiful statue. This is in Paris. And this helps get us up to date. Close up, there she is, in New Orleans. Remember, one of her titles is the Maid of the Maid of Orleans, the Maid of Orleans. There, so, uh, the French government um, um, gave a copy of the statue to the people of the United States, and there it is in New Orleans. So you see the tricolor and the French royal flag up there. So Joan is a bit of a controversial figure in in France because the royalists like her a little bit too much. So it makes the more Republican, progressive French a little bit uncomfortable with her. And it obviously made some American uncomfortable with her because there, just a couple of weeks ago in August, someone spray painted the plinth that it rests on in New Orleans. And 
there you are, it says tear it down. So here we are in the present day controversy. How am I doing on time? Okay, all right, good, all right, good. We're, we're moving along here. Now the present day. All right, there's the University of Virginia. It's a beautiful campus. One of the most beautiful campuses on the planet. So there it is in early spring, designed by Thomas Jefferson. And there's a nice little candlelight parade coming through the campus. Now if this were Christmas time and these were carolers, that would be one thing. Um, but unfortunately, it was these guys, mostly guys. Notice there are a couple of gals here. But anyhow, there you are. You can see that's the official flag of the Confederacy. You've got a Confederate battle flag or two back in there and some signs. And then, of course, that day went horribly awry when that young man rammed his car into a crowd. So we had a real mess. Now. If you like traditions, and you might be able to guess, I rather like tradition and history and stuff. These guys are really irritating. Okay, here is the rotunda. Jefferson loved rotundas. And this looks out to campus, so there's a front stairs and a back stairs, and plenty of room along these walls for memorials, like this one. So that's a memorial to all the University of Virginia men at those, in, that, in those days. Um, who died in the Civil War. Quite a lot. So there you are, the honor roll. So these, um, this plaque here, there they are, there are two of them. They're on their way out. Nice job, guys. Good work, you tradition-favoring people. Stage a nasty march like this and kill somebody, and it's not looking good for you. So there are these... These honor all, they're going to be displayed somewhere else, who knows. But already, the process of change by accretion was well underway at the University of Virginia. These are memorial plates um, for World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and here for Iraq. So already, that period in history, the Civil War is being tucked into the present. So already here, you can bet there's some African Americans included in these in these memorial plates tucked into the honor roll of the University of Virginia. Now there's our there's General Lee, and that's the statue in Charlottesville that they're talking about. It's on a traffic circle, and there he is in Richmond. A little different. Pretty good. Uh, Pretty good work by the sculptors. Late 19th century sculpture was good. We had a lot of great sculptors in the United States, late 19th century. Um, so <clears throat> this is why I think it's worth remembering Robert E. Lee as honorably as possible. That was his final orders to his troops. And even a nasty man like Nathan Bedford Forrest that devil forest, as adversaries called him. You have been good soldiers, you can be good citizens. Obey the laws, preserve your honor, and the government which you have surrendered to can afford to be and will be magnanimous. That's pretty good. Whether he had anything to do with the um, founding of the Ku Klux Klan, hotly debated. The textual evidence is, is meager, so it's, it's hard to say. But that's why we should, I think, honor these people in some fashion, because they, they surrendered. I mean, this is a tradition in the United States, is that if you surrender to us, we're going to be pretty decent to you. And that's the judgment of history, I think, on the Confederacy. They fought nobly in one of the most ignoble causes ever fought. That's in Grant's memoir. Now, in the current controversy. Andrew Young served in the Carter administration as uh, United Nations ambassador, mayor of Atlanta, still alive. There he is. So that's his opinion. Now the only part of this statement I don't really don't like is, and I know what he's trying to do. But <laughs> 
Um, not some stupid monument. Well, all right. I mean, monuments aren't stupid. They're very important. But be careful what you do with monuments, especially monuments to soldiers. Well, I do have a policy recommendation. If, the, if a monument to a soldier is anywhere near a battlefield or a cemetery, especially leave it alone. Um, if it's in a traffic circle, well, now this gets into a fuzzy area. I'm still in favor of change by accretion, but public space is for the public to determine what to put in traffic circles and parks and stuff. So, change by accretion. It's been happening. This is Arthur Ashe. How many of you know who Arthur Ashe is? Oh, good. Okay. For those of you that don't, he was a great tennis player. Um, and he died relatively young. And um, this statue is on Monument Avenue in Richmond. So there's a statue of Jefferson Davis, Andrew Jackson, Stonewall Jackson, and um, Robert E. Lee, and now Arthur Ashe. Controversial when it went up, but up it went, and there it is. And I kind of like this symbolism. He's got a tennis racket and a Bible. Well, books, whichever book you want to think. So this is not, uh, does this statue belong with a bunch of generals? Well, in a way, no, but in a way, yes, because we're all fighters. I mean, to, to be alive, you, you need to fight to take control of your life fight decently, I hope, with your friends and family to stand up for yourself decently. So games of competition, pretty important in our society. Well, there he is. Nice photograph. Pretty good statue, too. All right, now, a lot of talk about this place. Anyone recognize this spot? Stone Mountain in Georgia. Anyone been there? It's supposed to be really pretty. And it's a park. Um, easy to drive in. People picnic there. You can take the train in. Um, there's an aerial tramway you can take to the top. So there are the there are the guys again. Lee and I believe Davis and Jackson, I think, is the trio. These two guys look so much similar I can't discern. I'm pretty sure that's Jeff Davis. See the goatee? More of a full beard. The sculptor is Gutsum Borglund. The guy who did um, um, Mount Rushmore, and it's big. See, big. I mean big. But look, there's uh, plenty of room to add something. I mean, a good likeness of Martin Luther King, Edgar Evers, any number of other people. Hmm, President Obama, maybe. I mean, there's, there's, there. We got plenty of room to add to add people to this thing. And what they are talking about, and this is Andrew Young again, is putting a big freedom bell on top of Stone Mountain because Dr. King said, let freedom ring in his great speech in front of the Lincoln Memorial. Let freedom ring from Stone Mountain, Georgia, <clears throat> to the great Redwoods and so on. Beautiful speech, beautiful idea. So just to remember... Heal trauma rather than perpetuate it. Connect us to one another, remind us of our higher purpose. So we've got at least one of these in the United States. All right, possible additions. Changing by accretion. There's plenty of, our, plenty of room for new stuff. Now this idea, this is... I think American football coaches are some of the greatest organizational and, and inspirational geniuses in the country. We lavish a lot of time and money on football coaches. And they're brilliant. They're brilliant motivators of human beings. And they've made it really clear. You can play football, basketball, whatever. I don't care. You know, where you came from or what language you speak, you're, you're on the team if you're, if you're good. That's an amazing example that they set every Sunday. So we've got a great memorial in the United States, my favorite. I could talk for hours on the Lincoln Memorial. So there it is. And you have that commanding statue and the inscription behind that self-identifies it as a temple 
as a sacred space where something really, really important can be learned and experienced. So here, read that. That's by a great Civil War historian, Bruce Catlin. Perhaps there was all meaning to it somewhere. Perhaps everything that the nation was and meant to be had come to focus here beyond the graves and the remembered echoes of the gun and the wreckage of lives that were gone forever. Perhaps the whole of it somehow was greater than the sum of its tragic parts. And perhaps here on this windswept hill, the thing could be said at last so that the dry bones of the country's dreams could take on flesh. The orator finished. That was Edward Everett who talked for two hours. And after the applause had died away, the tall man in the black frock coat got to his feet, two little sheets of paper in his hand, and he looked out over the valley and began to speak. Now that photograph was taken a couple weeks before the Gettysburg Address. And there's just amazing character in that, in that face. And there's the address and the statue. And then my closing meditation One of my favorite art historians, Vincent Scully, one contemplates the terrible vulnerability of Zeus, God of human justice, in our fanatic world. Now, the temple to Lincoln is indeed a temple to, to justice, the quest for justice. If you put up a new statue somewhere that wants to say something important, let it be this good or look at it in terms as, as if Lincoln were looking at you. And Lincoln's asking, now, what are you adding to our conversation? Young man, young woman. Okay, time for questions. so much sure. um, for the wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering, if, I think you're right, I think that a good memorial um, helps helps um, a country remember yeah. and move on and heal in the process. Um, what about the, the, um, the problem about how a number of the memorials in the South were actually erected oh, yeah. as provocations, like uh, Stone Mountain that had been yeah. the site of mm -hmm. the founding of the Second Ku Klux Klan and was uh, commissioned during um, civil rights, for example, and uh, in the 1960s, it was when it was executed. So, uh, and that so that was that was sort of an, a, an assertion of a, of this romanticized uh, bygone past. And so, so um, how do you feel about the place of these memorials that that weren't were erected by people who felt the loss, but who are, are trying to celebrate something that, that um, they're afraid might, might um, go the way of history, as it were. Um, a lot of the statuary in the South went up in the late 19th century, 1870, 1880, after Reconstruction, after the federal troops departed, and the voters in the North got, just got tired of the whole business and said, just all right, fine, go govern yourselves. So it is the tragedy of American history that uh, General Lee and others received generous terms of surrender, told their troops to go home, obey the law, and plant a crop. And some of them did, and, and unfortunately some of them didn't. So yeah, these, these, yeah, these statues went up with, you might say, ignoble purpose. And I guess my only hope is that the country now is big enough to, to just embrace this whole thing rather than try to wipe them all out. 
And that's why I showed you these statues of Cromwell and Savonarola and uh, remind us of an age when one government came in, abolished the rascals, dug them up, chopped their heads off. I mean, this is, this is not how we, how we do things, ideally. Um, and I propose uh, ceremonies of reconciliation, some more statuary. So, so even this ignoble era in American history, the late 19th century until the Civil Rights era gets, gets folded into American history as we move forward. that I agree with you totally that the, uh, the memorial shouldn't be edited uh, that is censored and eliminated yeah. Yeah. because I think that that can have bad consequences. I, uh, I agree with your approach, but not through logic at this point, but just my feeling. I was wondering if you could uh, perhaps logically talk about the pros and cons of what you favor, which I agree with, mm -hmm. which is enhancing the collection of memorials rather than getting rid of ones you don't like. What would be the advantage of that versus uh, what has been going on lately, tearing down some old Confederate memorials? Yeah. Well, Maybe that's my next my next talk. I have a bunch of images in my computer of of statues being removed. In the past 50 years, a lot of statues have come down all over the world. Mm, I think something like 1,200 statues of Lenin, probably twice that many statues of Joseph Stalin. Um, fortunately, no statues of Hitler went up. You know the German. The Nazi party had more important work on its mind than putting up statues of Hitler. You generally don't put up statues of people now until, until you're dead. I mean, you, don't, you don't get a statue until you die. Back in Roman times, emperors got statues of themselves placed all over the place so people could see who the, who the emperor was. There was no photography, no internet, all that, all that sort of thing. Um, so the answer I'm groping towards is that Robert E. Lee has much some much more likable qualities than Lenin and Stalin. So both the people are, have something redeeming in them, um, and the artwork is better. Just because all those statues of Lenin, it's pretty boring looking at these statues of Lenin being ripped out. They were just about the same. They probably punched them out in one of those Soviet era factories and squirted out statues of Lenin by the thousands. And every town had to have its statue of Lenin with the beard and the hand up like this. They're all the same. Um, even China's taking down statues of Chairman Mao, and they're all the same. I mean, there's just, there's just nothing, very little redeeming about these characters. And the fact they made so many of them makes it all the, all the easier to tear them down. And I think, realistically speaking, some of these statues of, of Lee and uh, Jefferson Davis and people um, probably are going to come down eventually. They've, they've got some low-hanging fruit already. A bunch of statues of Confederate generals in Baltimore. Nobody in Baltimore cares about the Civil War at this point. There's almost nobody left. And one statue we could put up, there's no statue in the south of James Longstreet, one of Lee's greatest generals. And he didn't get a statue in that era because he was a Yankee sympathizer at that point or so he was seen. He was not wounded in battle during the Civil War, but he was wounded during civil unrest in New Orleans in 1872. As the c commander of the local garrison, there was a crowd of uh, white citizens, an armed mob, and they shot James Longstreet. Quite a story, quite a story. So I guess I'd say, look, don't blame the statues. The people represented in the statues are better than the people who put them up. So we'll try to remember the admirable qualities of people like Robert E. Lee, and we'll just do our best to tuck the horrible behavior of the Ku Klux Klan and people who lynch people, and just do our best to let history rain its judgment upon them, and we tuck the statues into, our, into the big 
tapestry of American history. I don't know if that's logical or not. Yeah, I'd base it more on the history of that person than on the people who put it up and what they what they put it up for. Yes, generally, especially if it's General Lee on a battlefield or on a cemetery. Ah. Yeah, because his redeeming qualities are a little less apparent, shall we say? <laughs> I don't know. You could put a statue of him up uh, in the middle of every interstate highway or something. He built the Autobahn, right? I, I, I don't think that's going to fly. Now, the objectionable stuff he did was so systematic and, and so awful. Also, he had no compunction about it. You could go through Robert E. Lee's correspondence and find his own ambivalence about slavery and about the cause for which he was for which he was fighting, and then most of all because of um, how he surrendered. I mean, he, the end of the Civil War could have been worse. We look at the late 19th century, it was a rough period in American history, especially if you were African American. The terrible period, terrible thing to put, to put that population through. But a guerrilla war could have gone on forever. I've got a quotation on that, I didn't read it, but uh, some of Lee's officers Officers proposed that to him, and he said, forget it. I'm surrendering to General Grant and going home. I suggest you guys do the same. So that moral example, just for that example alone, well, that's pretty good. What, what are we going to do? Now, some, um, some generals were hanged after the war. The commandant of Andersonville Prison was hanged afterwards. Um, it was still a pretty tough era. Capital punishment was carried out on a number of Confederate leaders. Yeah. Concerning uh, the lack of statues to, to Adolf Hitler. Yes. Um, Thank God. Yeah. Yes. Well, but there is there is the house that Hitler was born in. Yeah. In uh, Vienna. Right. And um, uh, there's a controversy. As if it were a statue, it's not yeah. a statue, but it's fulfilled with similar functions yeah. as, as a memorial. And there's a controversy swirling <sighs> around that house. Should the house be taken down or should the house be left standing? Right. And now, it's usually people on the extreme right that yeah. are arguing to keep it as, as a memorial. Well, so they, they don't even say memorial, but that seems to be their intention. On the other hand, I can see from a historical point of view, from the standpoint of historical preservation and education, there's an argument for keeping that house standing. Sure. Because the more we pull down physical yeah. memorials to our past, maybe, uh, maybe the more ignorant we become of our past, at least on some level. Well, I guess I could, uh, fortunately, the, um, <coughs> um, uh, Hitler's handlers took care of getting rid of his body for us, but we didn't have to decide what to do about that. You go back to other dictators we didn't like very much. Um, if the Prussians had captured Napoleon after Waterloo, they'd have just shot him. They might have given him a blindfold and a cigarette. No, that hadn't been invented yet, but they'd have shot him. Um, so he had enough sense to surrender himself to the, to the British. And they thought, we're not making a martyr out of this guy, and we're not putting him back on St. Elba. We're going to take him to a nice South Seas island called St. Helena, and we're going to park him there until he dies. And then when he dies, the French can do with him what they wish. And they made a big, I don't know why I'm pointing, because like, I've got the photograph somewhere. They made a big beautiful mausoleum for him. And that was the first place 
Hitler visited when he visited Paris. Adolf, what did you do when you went and visited Paris? Well, I went to Napoleon's tomb. Oh, really, Adolf, was it nice? Yeah, very nice. He stood there and gazed at it for the better part of an hour, surrounded by his henchmen. And you can see the photographs. They're all just standing there. So what did he do with Napoleon? And he, he treated himself as a, almost as a demigod during his own life. And... I guess you'd say by now he's he's getting tucked into the into the folds of history and disappearing into memory like Savonarola. <clears throat> A couple of statues of him. All right, Savonarola happened. There's some lessons there to the reform he tried to institute. He was a fanatic. Oh, go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, who is at this point? Yeah. Ah. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's correct. There's some polling data on this, and of course, you know, polling data, it's hard to say. The polling data I've looked at indicated profound ambivalence on the part of the African-American population. Some think they should be taken down and some don't. Um, Confederate battle flag, you can make a distinction between the flag of the Confederacy and the Confederate battle flag. Fortunately, um, the Confederacy did follow the rules of war by and large. So you could single out groups of soldiers who don't follow the rules of war, like various SS squads in the German army did not follow the rules of war. And on the Eastern Front, nobody followed the rules of war. Neither the, neither the Russian army nor the German army followed the usual rules of, rules of war. Uh, it's amazing how in the midst of horrendous killing, generals and soldiers in some cases managed to behave themselves reasonably decently, given the fact that they're out there to kill each other. It's really quite an amazing aspect of human behavior that in the middle of war you can wave a white flag and the generals go out and talk to each other or send their aides back and forth and exchange messages, arrange truces, and then they go back to this horrible business of killing, horrible business of killing people. Um, the Confederate flag, is its use is gradually easing off, except among the most extreme people. Um, and I think that's going to continue. And any such, well, what are we going to come up with in the United States of America? The Confederate Flag and Symbols Extirpation Act of 2020-something. It's not going to happen during this administration anyway. So it's not going to be the Extirpation Act of 2018. Um, we'll have to wait at least a decade for this. And do we really want to do this? Is this cure worth it to try to rub this out and rip this sacred symbol out of the fingers of a of the handful of people who are getting old and moving on and I I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Making money at it.
They are. I understand. Well, the University of Mississippi football team used to take the field behind a Confederate flag. The cheerleader ran out with a Confederate flag and out they marched. Well, they're not doing this anymore because half the team is black. See, then they're not, they're not charging out of the field at Ole Miss. And um, from what I gather, I, I'm actually a bit of a student of the pageantry of college football, which I think is just remarkable and fascinating and fun for the most part. Um, Dixie is still the favorite song of Old Miss fans, but a lot of people don't like it. And face it, folks, it is a great song. It is a fabulous tune. It makes you just want to stand up and kick your heels. It's a great tune. And Abraham Lincoln liked it. Remember Dr. Martin Luther? Dr. Martin Luther wrote hymns. He said, why give, give the devil the good hymns? So he would take hymns written by Catholics, the enemy at the time, and rewrite the lyrics. You know, presto, presto changeo. You take these symbols in an act of cultural jujitsu, and you do your best to repurpose it, make fun of it, you know, do the, do the best you can. All we can hope is that Confederate flag display will be, it might be getting more popular amongst a more marginalized group of people, but I don't think any Southern University is going to send its, its teams out onto the field with that flag in front of them. And that's why I suggested uh, whoever the Alabama football coach is, he's one of the greats, right? He could just about walk on water in the South. Very important gentleman. These guys could do an enormous amount to affect some sort of reconciliation and tell the white constituents of their universities, guys, we got to move on in some fashion. And they'd pay attention. I hope. <laughs> Okay, you're very, very welcome. Thank you.